Chapter 12 is going to require a little bit of a thought transition. Okay? We've been talking about like intermolecular forces and liquids and solids and solutions and all that stuff that kind of tied together there in chapter 9, 10, and 11. But here in chapter 12, we're going to make a switch and talk about something that's pretty new, okay? which is all about chemical kinetics. Thinking about the time frames of reaction, which is something we haven't really talked about. You know, we'll say, will it go? Yes or no. But here we're thinking about how fast a reaction is going to happen. And we'll talk about some other things like how they occur on the molecular scale, which is a chemical mechanism, if you've ever heard that word before. So we're probably looking at about five total videos for chapter 12 here. In this first video, we're going to cover 12.1 and 12.2 together. And so let's go ahead and get into it. First thing up, what is a rate? Because we're going to talk about rates a lot here in chapter 12 and for the rest of the semester. Yeah. So you've maybe heard of rate before in a different class, maybe biology or physics, right? You can measure rates of plenty of different things. Yeah. It's just something changing over time, right? Your speed is distance changing over time, for example. Yeah. But we and your speed of a car, right? That is rate of reaction thinking about the world of chemistry is measuring changes in concentration okay and if we're thinking about looking at a reaction okay we've got reactants on the left and products on the right okay we can measure a reaction rate one of two ways either by tracking how the reactants disappear how fast that happens or tracking how the products appear okay because one thing's being consumed another thing is being produced Okay. So if we measure those concentrations, the changes in them over a set amount of time, we can get the rate of the reaction. Okay. But again, concentration is important and the units, as you'll see in this chapter, are important as well. So let's think about the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to look at this. Um, this is a balanced chemical equation up top here for the decomposition of H2O2. Okay. This is something that happens spontaneously. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide maybe you've got in the medicine cabinet, right? Over time, will decompose into water and oxygen. Okay. And the rate at which that happens can be measured by something that's called a rate expression down here. Okay. Specifically looking at hydrogen peroxide, over time that disappears. Okay. So we look at the change in concentration of the reactant, hydrogen peroxide, over a set amount of time. And because reactants disappear, notice that that is set to be negative. Okay? If we were doing either one of the products, it would be positive. But here, because it's a reactant, it's negative. Okay? So changing concentration of reactant, how do we get that? Final concentration minus initial concentration. Remember these brackets here represent concentration in molarity. Okay? And then that subscript F represents final, subscript I represents initial. So your final concentration minus your initial concentration over your final time, right? T stands for time, minus your initial time. So writing that a different way, instead of final minus initial, we can just put delta there, okay? Delta represents change in. So we have change in hydrogen peroxide, molar concentration over change in time. Again, negative because it's a reactant. <clears throat> Pretty much everything I said previously is shown on this slide. Okay. Brackets represent molar concentrations. T represents time. And depending on what units we have, you can express that a couple of different ways. We'll talk shortly about what units are typically accepted. Okay. And the sign depends on reactant or product. Negative if it's a reactant, positive if it's a product. Right? Think P for positive, P for product. So how do these rates get determined? Yep. This is something that's done experimentally. You determine the rate of a reaction experimentally using data. And this is what that looks like. Yep. We see here, right, as time proceeds over a course of 24 hours, we measure the concentration of hydrogen peroxide that's in solution. Yep. So this is the data that you would be generating in the lab. Yep. Then you can look at, for each of these, final minus initial, to get your change in hydrogen peroxide concentration. Okay. Also your change in temperature. 
So here, for example, final is 0.5 minus one is the initial. So delta H2O2 is negative 0 0.5. Delta T is six hours, okay, because it's been six minus zero. And we put one over the other and we get a rate of decomposition of 0.0833 molar per hour. Okay. But notice as time proceeds and that reaction continues to occur, the rate isn't consistent. It doesn't stay that 0.08, right? As the reaction goes on, the rate gets slower and slower. And that's okay, that's normal. Yep. Because there are many different types of rates that you should know. And, and these are the three here on slide six that I want you to understand both what they mean and how to determine them graphically, which we have on the next slide. Yep. Most times we're gonna be dealing with average rates, okay? where you use the times and concentrations from the start and the end of the reaction. Okay. So that would be using the data from zero and 24 hours. Okay. That would give you the average rate, the rate for the whole overall reaction. Okay. That's compared to an instantaneous rate, which is calculated at any given time, arbitrary, you choose which one you're calculating it at. And then the initial rate, which is an instantaneous rate specifically at time zero. So as soon as the reaction begins, what's the rate? That's the initial rate. Okay. So know what these mean and then know what they look like graphically, which we have on the next slide. But in case this doesn't make sense, think about a car, right? If you're taking a trip in the car, you know, say you're driving to campus, for example, from home, in that situation, you might have an average trip speed of say 30 miles an hour. That's your average rate, but you weren't going 30 miles an hour instantaneously okay, when you pulled out of the driveway. And you might've had a higher instantaneous rate when you're on a highway, for example, speed limit 55. Right? So your speeds can change. Those are instantaneous rates, okay, but you have an average rate overall as well. And then the initial rate specifically is at time zero. Okay. So if we have a graph of concentration versus time, okay, this is typically what that graph is going to look like for a reactant. Okay. If you had a product, it would look the opposite. Okay. It would be the inflection of that. An average rate uses all of the data. An instantaneous rate here right, can be determined by that tangent line. Yeah. So drawing a tangent line allows you to calculate an instantaneous rate. Yeah. And then the initial rate specifically has the tangent of time zero. Yeah. So make sure you understand the three differences, average, initial, instantaneous. Yeah. Now, the nice thing is with rates of reaction is we can relate rates of things disappearing for reactants and rates of things forming for products, just like we did molar amounts with stoichiometry way back in chapter four is the first time we did that. Assuming, of course, we have a balanced chemical equation. Okay? So that's the first thing you're always checking. You should be in the habit of that by now. Always double check that a reaction is balanced. And then if that's the case, you can compare how things disappear and form. Okay, for example, here with a coefficient of two and the fact that ammonia, NH3 here is a reactant, the rate of disappearance of ammonia is twice as fast as the rate of appearance of nitrogen. Yep. Because for every one nitrogen that's formed, two ammonias disappear. Yep. So the rate here is doubled that of nitrogen. The rate of formation of hydrogen is triple that of nitrogen. Yep. And that's nice, okay, because that's easy stoichiometry, and we can also see it graphically when the data gets plotted out. If we were to look at an instantaneous rate or the average rate, right, hydrogen, as I just mentioned, is three times faster than nitrogen, and ammonia is disappearing twice as fast as nitrogen is forming. All just done using those stoichiometric coefficients right here, two and one and three. Yeah, not too difficult. Here's another example and a test question you might anticipate. Okay? 
if the rate of formation of bromine is 1.21 times 10 to the negative fifth, and these we'll talk about units later on, molar per second, what is the rate of production of H2O? Okay. Well, this is a super simple question if you know what you're doing, because right, we first check that the reaction is balanced, which it is, and then we look at the stoichiometric coefficients. For bromine and for water, they're the same, three and three. Okay? So the rate of production of water is the same as the rate of production of bromine. And those two words that are used interchangeably, formation, production. So water is also formed at 1.21 times 10 to the negative fifth molar per second. Okay. What about the rate of consumption of bromine? Well, that has a coefficient of five. Okay. But that's not to say that I multiply that number by five because it's five compared to three. Okay. So I take that 1.21 times 10 to the negative fifth, multiply it by five divided by three, okay. and the rate of consumption of bromide is 2.02 .02 times 10 to the negative fifth, okay. five thirds of this number. Stoichiometry, just like you're already used to. Okay. I always, of course, recommend setting that up with dimensional analysis, just to be careful if you want to check your units. So that wraps up 12.1. Let's now jump into 12.2, factors that can affect reaction rates. Okay? And I recommend you start writing all these down in a list because they will all be tested. Okay? All the factors that can affect a reaction rate. Okay? Number one, chemical nature of the reacting substances. Okay? Even if a reactant and a product might seem similar, to one another, both metals, both gases, anything like that, aqueous solution. Uh, the specific chemical identities affect chemical rates, which is kind of a no-brainer, right? What the chemical is affects the chemical rate. So number one's super easy. You probably already knew that without knowing it, without knowing it. Okay, common sense. Number two, okay, the state of subdivision of the reactant. And another way to say this is surface area. Okay. The reason for this is reactions always occur at the interface between two phases. These things actually have to interact with one another and be touching. Okay. So the larger the surface area of something, the faster the rate of reaction. Okay. Looking at an example right here of having an iron nail in a reaction with HCl versus iron powder. Okay, the iron powder reacts a lot faster because it has more surface area. Okay. Even though it's iron in both situations, more surface area will react faster. More surface area, faster reaction. Number three, temperature. Okay. Chemical reactions occur faster at higher temperatures. Higher temperature, faster reaction. Which is not to say that if you want to double a reaction speed, you need to double the temperature. Usually that's overkill. Uh, a good rule of thumb is you usually only need an increase of about 10 degrees Celsius to double the rate. There are a ton of exceptions to that. That's just a guiding rule, okay? But all I need you to know, higher temperature, faster reaction. And we'll explain why for all these in a later video. Number four, concentrations. Okay. Higher concentration, faster reaction rate. And the reason for that is because for a reaction to occur, not only do they have to be touching each other like we already covered, right? they have to specifically collide with one another called the effective collision. So the more things you have in solution, the greater the probability these things collide with one another. Okay. So higher concentration of reactants specifically, okay, changing products isn't gonna affect a reaction rate. Higher concentration of reactants faster reaction. Acid rain, maybe you've heard of that. Yeah. Acid rain has more sulfur dioxide in it, SO2, and that is what reacts with calcium carbonate in limestone. Yeah. It's not the water that's the problem, it's SO2, sulfur dioxide. Higher concentration in acid rain makes these things decompose faster. And our fifth and final factor that can affect a reaction rate is the presence of a catalyst. Okay. So that's number five, five total things that can affect a reaction rate, presence of a catalyst. Adding a catalyst speeds up a reaction. 
Maybe you've heard of a catalyst before, maybe not. Okay. What is the definition of a catalyst? substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction by lowering the activation energy okay, while not being consumed by the reaction. Okay, it can participate in the reaction, but it gets regenerated and spit back out at the end of the day. Okay, and it lowers the activation energy. What is the activation energy? Every re reaction has an activation energy, and it's the minimum amount of energy that's required for the chemical reaction to proceed and go forward. So you can think about a catalyst as providing a new pathway, okay, a new way for the reaction to occur by lowering the activation energy. It's like instead of driving over a mountain, okay, typically we have tunnels that we can drive through. Lower activation energy, it's a good way to think about it. Because this is called a reaction coordinate diagram okay, or a reaction energy diagram. We go from reactants to products. This reaction specifically is endothermic. Going from reactants to products. Okay. But we don't go straight there. It always goes over this energy barrier. That's the minimum amount of energy to get the reaction to occur. Okay. And that's why a high temperature helps speed up reactions because it gives more energy to the reactant to get over this hill. But what a catalyst does is it provides a new pathway and it makes that energy barrier smaller. Okay. At this stage in the game, you don't have to worry about how. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the chapter. Okay. But just be aware that a catalyst lowers the activation energy, makes it easier to get over this hill uh, and get to the products. Lowers the activation energy. That's how a catalyst works. Okay. Think about it like if you're out for a run. Uh, do you want to run over the big hill or do you want a catalyst to come along and give you a lower hill to run over? Okay. So catalyst and five total factors that speed up reactions. Know those, know the basics from 12.1, and we will continue to use these ideas to discuss chemical kinetics in the remaining videos.